this session. And I would like to introduce Ligia Nobre, uh, who has flown in all the way from Brazil uh, today to um, give us a paper entitled, very simply, The Slab. I just would like to say that this uh, is the beginning of a research uh, that has been developed by Kazuna Kernu and I. Uh, Kazu unfortunately could not be here, to, cannot be here today due to professional reasons. So This paper aims at approaching uh, the territories inhabited by the low-income population in the metropolis of São Paulo. The analysis focuses on a specific element, one of widespread use in housing, the concrete slab. The analysis of the concrete slabs found in the dwellings of low-income groups takes into consideration the poor conditions, the risks and the vulnerability that prevail in those territories. It also recognizes the wide gap between the large groups that inhabit those precarious areas and the people who enjoy better living conditions, thus revealing the profound inequalities that divide the metropolis. In Sao Paulo, it's economic power that dictates good living standards. The uneven distribution of the urban infrastructure is just a result of Sao Paulo's, not to mention Brazil's, income distribution pattern, one of the most uneven in the world. Such inequality between high and low incomes groups generate a tense and conflict-ridden situation with daily instances of urban violence aimed at people and property alike. Against this backdrop of social devastation, scales and temporalities attach to shifting territorial groupings. Here, we address this lapse concerning its different scales and temporalities in three different parts. The first, the access to the land, secondly, um, the temporality of housing constructions, and thirdly, the setting of micro-territories. Access to the land. It's important to bear in mind that the concept of illegal access to urban land has been defined by a system of which the principle of private property is a backbone. As a result, that concept naturally stems from the principles of protection and appreci appreciation of private pro property. Those who do not have the means to gain legal access to real estate now demand other alternatives to obtain it. This unofficial and somewhat illegal way of getting hold of land leads to new real estate systems lying on the fringe of official institutions. These new systems currently prevail in Brazilian metropolises, where millions of homes can be regarded as extra legal, both in clandestine settlements and in slums. This informal way of holding land, the major alternative for the low-income groups, is now understood. Sorry, is now understood as a byproduct of a legal system based on the private property, as well as a state that has been privatized in order to bolster the national industry, foster a consumer market that rules out social inclusion, carry out a development model that's uneven, concentrate wealth in the hands of the few. Sao Paulo developed and expanded within this context, having become the major industrial center in the country. In this metropolis, the history of urban regulation and public investment is typically the history of privilege granted to the upper class neighborhoods, as well as the history of infrastructure built exclusively for economic development. The creation of minimum housing conditions for the largest stemming from the resources of residents who have for decades demanded better regulation and implementation of existing and insufficient urban services. In Brazilian metropolis, the legal and the illegal are complementary in that they enable the reproduction of the economic system and the urban spaces, thus defying a shallow dualism of simplistic oppositions. The institutional, administrative and legal processes 
that govern the realm of the legal, com the legal comprise formal procedures that include certain social groups and ex exclude others. It's only those pieces of land that have been formally registered that are considered within the law as far as their use, occupancy and division are concerned. Other systems for holding areas of urban land, the only alternative of poor groups are regarded as illegal, as a result of which unofficial instances of metropolitan territorializations proliferate. The concrete slab is a ubiquitous element in the houses arising in all informal territory, namely the clandestine settlement, the occupancy of vacant urban land that has consolidated and the slums in their final consolidation stages. In fact, given the permanent legal system and the current urban and land occupation rules, it comes as no surprise that this type of concrete slab has become a crucial element in the unofficial strategies adopted by the low-income population in order to get land and build their homes. The slab then loses its programmatic nature and becomes more pragmatic. It is defined by the need to adjust the extension of one's own dwelling to the new family cycles. It's also a way of adjusting the building structure to the topographic profile of the terrain. In Rio de Janeiro, where the slums have been embedded on the slopes of extremely steep hills, as well as in Sao Paulo's most peripheral slums, where sharp slopes are also common, the structure of the dwellings defines small horizontal, roughly square-shaped plans, either covered or in the open air, of mixed use, where several instances of sociability materialized. In many cases, a new household compartment is expected to build on it. It remains a sign of what is to come. The informal ways in which the process of land occupation unfolded in clandestine settlements, in formerly vacant states and in the slums, extend to the manner in which the houses are built gradually, often carried out by the inhabitants themselves and result of official license. Access to the urban land is a joint family effort, usually encompassing several years of hard work and financial investment. The main purpose being the building of their own home. Such achievement involves parents, children, and other relatives that are active both in formal and informal markets. Their earnings directed at satisfying their basic needs, as well as the purchase of building materials such as bricks, sand, cement, among others. Since there is no national social security system to protect those families, Owning a house becomes, even on an official basis, a minimum guarantee for the coming years. Assets that can be disposed of the emergency situations. It is precisely that guarantee that explains the efforts that family made over so many years. In clandestine settlements, in neighborhoods where vacant land has been occupied and is lumped, group efforts aimed at enabling the construction of millions of houses proliferate. It's not uncommon for neighbors, friends, and relatives to give away some of their free time and join in the building initiative. Filling this lab with concrete is a particularly significant moment in that process, taking place on sunny weekends or bank holidays. Neighborhoods, neighbors, friends, and relatives, usually men, come early in the morning and prepare the concrete by hand. The entire process is carried out manually, and it's usually over at the beginning of the afternoon. People then gather together for a barbecue party with plenty of beer. Nevertheless, the family of their homeowner and their friends are not the only ones to participate. Professionals are also hired on an informal basis, provided that the homeowner has enough money for the most arduous tasks, such as bricklaying and the setting of beams and pillars. Many of the people who today live in the periphery of Brazilian metropolis have acquired a greater or lesser degree of expertise as workers in the great building companies that boomed in the 60s and 70s, erecting blocks of flats, of buildings, bridges, and that experience comes in hand now that 
new homeowners need the, their services. The long building process, which comprises bricklaying, setting door or window frames, paving floors, as well as the preparation of the concrete slab, may speed up or slow down according to the amount of money that the family is able to dispose of, and it might extend over a decade. The ongoing economic crisis has widened the social gap in Brazil, popularizing a considerable portion of the population who flocks to the peripheries of the great metropolis to live in Mahavazard neighborhoods and to inhabit houses that are never completely ready. The population of those neighborhoods is growing and the housing states are getting denser. In this respect, in this respect extremely popular in those households becomes a vital element vital element in people's strategies for getting their homes. It can serve as this lab can serve as the base for a new building, a new home. A new home for someone's recently mar married children, maybe a new home for relatives in need. The new house can also be sold or let and thus generate a complementary income for its landlords. Sometimes it's just this lab that's on sale providing its new owners with a surface on which to build their own house. Like these labs, other outdoor surfaces inside a plot can be also exploited economically. One, two or three small houses can be built in on those areas and then be sold or let. However, for such undertaking, one needs to build up enough financial resources, which is usually the case of those who carry out some sort of trade in the neighborhood. Therefore, those suburbs gradually evolve into local microeconomies based on retailing activities that gather to for the needs of those who live nearby, the shopkeepers whose profit is obtained from such premises as bars, bakeries, pharmacies, building material shops, supermarkets, etc., are able to react to other houses inside their own plots, sometimes on the various labs of their own homes. All those activities are in progress in the peripheries of the great metropolis and have given, given rise to increasingly denser housing and population patterns, which in turn generate other cycles of equally unofficial undertakings. The evidence of such progress can be seen in the emergency of multiple story houses. In these cycles, prior to being converted into a piece of real estate on sale in the informal market, the concrete slab takes root in the structure of these dwellings. It becomes the plane on which several forms of sociability take place, shaping the daily routine in the periphery of Sao Paulo. Such semi-domestic instances of sociability also create narratives that reveal the meetings and relationships imprinted on a territory that was first and foremost fashioned out of the sheer need to inhabit. The concrete slab configures a continuous and heterogeneous field and catalyzes a collective sharing of urban space, visually, physically, and through a common imaginary that goes beyond the households. In those houses, the concrete slab is a special place which is found in different shapes, finishes and partitions, and have multiple functions. In general, it's covered with roof tiles and its permanent features comprises water tanks, coverings to give protection against the rain and sun, occasionally satellite uh, dish aerials. It also serves as a storeroom where building material, buckets, boxes, plants are kept. Its multiple functionalities are particularly useful at the weekends. Children fly kites, dogs play around, Women chat, boys and girls flirt, men drink beer or smoke, people watch TV, play dominoes and even football. People have barbecues, birthdays and weddings, are celebrated and parties are thrown with music at high volume and dancing. The concrete slab is a social place for families, neighbors and friends, a leisure community, center for the population, an alternative to club, beach, parks and waterfalls, quite inaccessible because of expensive public transportation and long distances. Typically a woman's and children's territory where the housework is done, clothes hanging out on the washing line, 
are ubiquitous in the urban landscape. This lab can serve for a beauty saloon or a place for gossiping on some bassing. It should be pointed out that its multiple functionalities and territorialities, either for men, women, children, youngsters, the elderly or mixed groups, generate and are made of social networks of mutual weight that are based on exchange as well as serving as source for, of information and informal work, thus strengthening interpersonal relationships. One's own home is considered a safe place as opposed to the street, usually associated with violence. In these houses, with few and narrow openings, these labs are large open areas, offering not only a view of the horizon, but also room for even negotiations. It's like being at home and at the same time outdoor, in touch with the outside world. The access to this lab is generally through narrow ladders controlled by the respective house dwellers. The concrete slab, being the topmost point, offers a panoramic view, panoramic view. The eyes and body, strategically positioned on top of this safe place, negotiate and establish relationships of trust and control. This can be active or passive, direct or indirect, encompassing looks, smells, sounds, bodies, facts. Women sunbathing and a bunch of men enthusiastically observing them, parties and barbecues, or kites flying are all occasions for such contacts. In the extreme case of drug trafficking, those concrete slabs with a privileged broad view on, of the territory are occupied establishing an almost absolute surveillance regime on the streets, as well as closed territories. Both bringing remote hopes of an unlimited horizon and offering a good view of the neighbors' homes, a breeding ground for gossip, those surfaces mobilize and interact with one's own life, showing the faint limits between the individual and the collective, as well as joining the domestic and the urban dimensions. The concrete slab is also only present in the collective imaginary, appearing in rap lyrics of the hip hop movement in everyday language in the local economy as stores selling concrete slabs and other building materials expand in daily life as well as in the floors to be. A survival strategy, the reinvention of this small constructive element has direct implications in the way metropolitan territories are generated and perceived. They provide visibility to the complex tangle of economic, social, legal, cultural, environmental and urban relations in the metropolises of Sao Paulo, as reported here, as well as in Brazilian big cities and, and possibly in other countries. That's it. Thank you. So, Victoria actually was quite um, generous because she, she was suggesting that uh, my paper is about uh, French housing earlier on. Um, actually, uh, it is not, or if it is, it's only so very indirectly. And what I would like to do is just to offer some, I mean, a few general comments about what has happened to the distinction which has been made between public and private um, over perhaps the last 20 or perhaps 30 years. And for quite some time, um, I think, functionalism has become a sign of evil, of something which is bad, and this has 
join the legends of panopticons of bedlam and workhouses, all the things which have been described by Foucault and others. And as a result, we can no longer talk about urban space in terms of its uses, spaces, for instance, for recreation or for work and many others. This has been condemned by many as zoning, and to divide the city by zoning would in fact be, so we are told, undemocratic, because the spaces of the city belongs to everyone. Therefore, uh, the city, the space of the city, ought not to be specialized. Uh, it must be described instead, um, or rather not in the concrete categories of use, but with abstract categories. We can say, for instance, uh, that it is open, as in streets and park, or closed, as in squares, we can say that it should be densely or sparsely occupied. And in short, the principal method of the urban designer is to actually calibrate the spaces of cities in a sliding scale between open and closed, between public and private. Uh, an example of, of this subtle gradation uh, would be, for instance, the Palais Royale. There will be many others. But I think what interests me with the Palais Royal is that it has been one of the uh, favorite places of somebody like Colin Rowe, and I think Colin Rowe has played a rather prominent role in shaping what we regard as a distinction between public and private, at least in architectural circles. So the proper medium of the urban designer is not use or function it is form, and the urban designer can decide on the height of surrounding buildings, on the elevation of their facades, perhaps on the occupation of their lower floors. Um, and so one might propose, for instance, here a shop and a theater there and a cafe just over there. What the urban designer, however, cannot do is to work with the space itself. The space of the city is what the citizens make of it. Urban designers draw the facades of the adjoining buildings, but it is people who actually make the space. And I think this is a rather convenient division of labor where the planner's ethic remains intact and the people remain sovereign. So the taste for places like the Palais Royal or more recently a place like Somerset House, um, a taste for arcades, for squares and fountains is still, to my surprise, perhaps regarded as the high point in urban design. And I think the contrary is actually true urban designers have, as a result, lost interest in most spaces in the city, and unless spaces can be invested with the traditional values ascribed to city centers and to their history, they actually go unrecognized. Yet, uh, these spaces, by far, constitute a greater part of the city, and one could say, for argument's sake, that uh, these non-spaces, uh, unrecognized spaces, add up to perhaps 75% of the area of Paris and perhaps to 95% of the area of the more ordinary, less historical cities. And because of a well-meaning but I think misguided prejudice in favor of publicness, in favor of mixity and density, the urban designer has renounced much, if perhaps uh, even most, of his responsibilities. Now, this prejudice is effective in some places, um, and of course in the traditional uh, core of cities, but it is, I think, unworkable elsewhere. 
in the suburbs, for instance, where there is little time for finesse and little history to speak of, modern or scientific planning is the only means so far that we know. Where history has barely begun, the urban designer has no existing fabric upon which to start. He must, by necessity, base his work on first principles, on axioms, and on assumptions. But with the fall of modern planning, how could he possibly do this? A hundred years ago, Adolf Loos imagined modern architecture as a redeeming force against crime. Today, modern architecture does not redeem crime. Rather, many have argued that it actually causes it. And we can take an ex as an example um, a film like Lion. It describes a divided city, or perhaps two cities, in the first one, unemployed immigrants live by day in modern housing estates where they are harassed by the police. Uh, the second city is connected to the first by suburban trains. And this is, of course, the second city. This is central Paris with its streets, its squares, and its arcades. Um, the inhabitants of the first city visit the second one by night when it becomes for them a vast playground, or at least that is the kind of picture which is presented in the film La Haine. So in the first city, the city which perhaps one could say is the city of the vast majority, architects see today a major responsibility in guaranteeing security. So they add things like interphones and pitch roofs. And in this way, they think that they demodernized housing estates and root out crime, according to precepts which I think are not actually set by the profession, but are set by the police or affiliated institutions. So in that sense, I mean, one might actually say that architecture is no longer designed and rather that it is measured with a police tape in terms of the distance between car and front door and between communal stairway and apartments. Not only in the suburbs, but now everywhere, architects imagine that the solution to insecurity lies in the strict separation between public and private. If only public and private domains were properly regulated, so would the life of citizens. Public space, the space owned by the state or, or owned by the states on, in custody for the citizens, is reduced to a minimum and the residual spaces between the street and the dwelling are increasingly privatized. As for urban design, as a result of this, it has shrunk to the tracing of the boundary between the safety of the things which we own and the danger of what we don't own. So first, legitimized by the likes, sorry, the likes of Colin Rowe, the public-private distinction has become, I think, a kind of fig leaf to common fears, to the fear, for instance, of youth who must be curfewed, as the present government has argued, and to the fear of immigrants who, again, it is argued, must often be interned. It has become a kind of fig leaf to a desire for the provision not of publicness, but of surveillance. And today, what actually separates publicness from privacy is hardly different from the thin blue line which separates criminal behavior from uh, the low-abiding citizens. And now, I think this notion of publicness has to a large extent been gutted 
from its old attributes of theater and play, those attributes which obviously people like Colin Rowe and many others were understandably fond of, and uh, it has perhaps been um, drastically perverted to actually give spatial expression to these spheres. And the picture may still be worse in that uh, this state of things actually confirm or helps to confirm these spheres. So I wonder, and this is a question, whether we uh, might not have actually walked into some kind of impasse and whether we should not in some way start again. And in this, I mean, I, I don't have any, of course, idea about where things are moving next, but nevertheless, I see two signs which, uh, at least for me, are hopeful. The first is a renewed interest in utopian projects, for instance, Constance New Babylon and Super Studio. And these projects, of course, are very fashionable. One doesn't know what is going to come out of this kind of interest. Uh, but nevertheless, they indicate something which, to my mind, is very important, and which is a uh, desire to actually come to grips with the totality of the city, not only the traditional city, or to try to replicate the traditional city out there in the periphery. And the other sign, the second sign, which uh, gives me um, some optimism, is the growing acceptance of the legitimacy of science in town planning. For instance, in the work of practices which have emerged recently, um, FOAs, this is, I understand, a quite controversial thing to say, but there will be many other practices which one could think of. And so we have at least two elements which are, in my view, necessary for the renewal of town planning. One is a vision of the totality, and the other is to have some kind of bones for a rational debate about what urban planning or urban design can be. Okay, well, I think um, that it should be quite clear that there is a uh, very fertile terrain for discussion um, between these four papers. Uh, I think that <laughs> there are a lot of issues which all of them bring up, and uh, then with relation to various case studies, and then Irene's paper at the end has kind of brought these, uh, some of these questions into a kind of more provocative uh, um, and questioning uh, kind of um, position. So, I, I mean, I, in, in a way, I think we couldn't say that we're, we're very far from some of the issues that we looked at this morning, in the sense one could, one could say that we've jumped from the place of the Pope to uh, being immersed in, uh, with the mob, in this kind of <coughs> teeming urban space, uh, which is very far from ideas of the city as a work of art, um, but instead has to do with various practices of inhabitation, um, the ways in which designs are changed by their users. Um, 
what daily life really does to architectural intentions. So um, I would, uh, I'll, I'll just open up the floor right now to questions and uh, we'll see how we go with that. Okay. Well, I mean, I I was actually very taken by Nishia's presentation. I thought it was really very engaging, mm -hmm. and I I agree with your comments. That's you know my comment. The comment which I have made, I would probably not be rel very relevant, let's face it, in a city like Sao Paulo. And, th and one of the reasons might be that if one is to have some planning at all, um, you know, organized with institution, perhaps, you know, with an intervention by the government in one form or the other, this actually costs money. And um, I um, don't know the situation in Sao Paulo, but mm -hmm. I expect that um, the government, if it tries to be involved in questions of urban planning, uh, must be extremely stretched. Yeah. And so that's the case which I have tentatively or very, very schematically made um, that um, the government could actually adopt a more comprehensive view of what the city had been and the more interventionist view would <coughs> maybe not be so relevant there. And yes, please. Okay, just um, if maybe I can be a bridge somehow, <laughs> because um, at at Rangsit, the rice fields were the subdivisions I was talking about um, is actually the product of very not not only urban planning but national economic planning, agricultural export policy. Uh, by uh, where the the royal family, the the king uh, of uh, Thailand, uh, hired uh, European experts for uh, certain things, and so the Dutch hydrologist Homan van de Heide masterfully, rationally planned this area for increased rice production and and retaining the water nutrients from this seasonal monsoon in a way that was more productive for the modernization of society. It was very helpful in um, Thailand's uh, pursuit of remaining independent and it's the only Southeast Asian state that wasn't colonized um, by the French and British and French and the China because, because of this rational planning. 
Um, there hasn't been, uh, well, it took in the first, uh, 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 there was a uh, constitutional monarchy since 1932, and, and they've been searching, f re searching for a mechanism to reincorporate planning, master planning, um, in the kingdom since then, and it's only recent that it has been uh, uh, enacted, and it's going to take another very long period of time before it's operational. Um, but what what I see possibly is uh, a scaling of of uh, large scale decisions that are that are that are made rationally with science and pragmatically and. Um, uh, small scale decisions and what what you're seeing now is you know the disaster where the urban design are the manicurists and um, and uh, and but there's no planning so uh, you know the most fertile soil in the country and, and it's destroying the uh, watershed and flooding the city of Bangkok etc 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 just because of this um, urban design <laughs> all the right rules are being and put into operation in terms of what uh, like some of the leading s spokespeople for urban design are saying you know and so um, and it's a disaster so I, I agree with you but I think there's uh, there's a lot of opportunity within that large scale um, land management and uh, especially the science of ecology and social sciences are much are reinvigorated now with uh, a new understanding of, of dynamics and non-equilibrium, and um, and so there there is the possibility of of local openness within this larger, which I think mm -hmm. is my utopian project. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, all I don't know if it's everywhere in the third world, but at least uh, in Brazil, and especially that's what you're trying to present is due to the law regulations and since everything is like uh, informal and formal, they try and it's so expensive to buy even if they are not legal lands or plots. They really try to, um, and they're usually like 10 by 40 if you were lucky or much uh, smaller. And then to really have the maximum uh, occupancy possibly. Uh, so and and uh, and they always do. I mean, it's part of the process. Like considering that they're going to sell the the Nexus Lab or the two others, they sometimes even uh, sell them before building them, or and always doing really really strong um, uh, concrete structures, and because they are thinking of the family, the children, the, the sisters, the brothers, uh, and yeah, that's, I must be. Um, they are, I mean, even if they look like, uh, they look alike, you have these lands and then you have this kind of illegal settlements um, that after a while they look very similar but they have a process very differently staged. Uh, the favelas, the slums, they are occupied and not at all um, pre-planned. The settlements, they are organized by um, very small sellers and then they organize and they make it. And usually you have like the infrastructure, 80 or 9%, they, are, they have them all. And what it's funny as well, it's like, um, <laughs> not funny, but uh, for example, for savory or water and, so, and energy, they usually ha have their own system of um, robbering and not paying the government. And it's very sophisticated uh, how they really, in order to escape for paying everything. And I'm afraid uh, uh, we should have.
Yes, indeed. I mean, if we go to an intellectual architecture, at least in Brazil, concrete is considered almost an intellectual material. And, um, and at the same time, indeed, it's in the 50s that you had the boom of industrialization and where all those people migrated to the cities and, and you have this process, industrialization happening and how they um, get this technology and yeah, indeed, and have a huge industry of concrete, indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, my question. <coughs> If I could take the first, first point, which to me is the one which I have most at, at heart. Um, at least in the architectural environment which I know, um, the paradigm has by and large been set by 
Rem Kohlhaus and other people affiliated to him. And what it has meant is that cities are, have become so large, are developing so fast, that uh, there is no possibilities left for planning at all. And I actually don't completely disagree with this, but I think it is only a part of the picture, perhaps a small part of the picture, which concerns those cities, especially the very large ones, uh, where there is a galloping immigration with everything which that entails in terms of economic problems and so on. And the architects, or perhaps especially the urban designers and planners' attention has been fixated on this kind of situation. So, for instance, we very rarely speak about th cities in Europe, but we very often speak of cities in Southeast Asia and perhaps, unfortunately, less in South America and South mm -hmm. Italy. Um, but those cities still probably amount to, I mean, I'm only guessing, the so cities which are not of that kind, um, let's say, you know, 80% of the world population. Now, we actually think that what cannot be done in those large metropolises actually cannot be done in those 80% of other cities. Now, to me, this seems, uh, this seems damaging. That is, it actually cancels a whole range of opportunities for planning, for organizing the space of the city, and for urban designers to actually exercise their professional capacity um, and improving people's lives. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, I think it definitely, just to think of one factor, I mean, sure, there's I'm sure there's a lot of other factors of why that occurs, but you can just think of the Marshall Plan where the top priority, the, t the, the largest amount of money uh, given to the reconstruction was towards industry. Housing was number five, and those jobs were given to very few architects. They were mostly relegated to engineers because of the need to build this these houses quickly and fast. So where the architects are going to go, where the money is, into industry, and make designing products to fill the inside of these more generic houses to kind of individualize them. Okay, maybe you're not going to have an architect design the house, but you can have an architect that's going to design the sofa and the chair and the interior space. So I think that's just kind of a way that architects still found a way to influence people's lives, but just on a different scale. I don't know what that scale is, like you were saying, but... And, and certainly, if I could add something, uh, last night in our PhD session we had um, <coughs> a presentation by Nochini on um, the kind of interior arrangement uh, of Thai houses. Nochini, are you here? Yeah, she's there. Um, but but I, I anyway, I was just very interested in uh, kind of comparing your paper last night with Brian's today about, I mean, because your discussion tended to focus on exteriors, um, 
you know, in kind of, let's say, rooms or, or other things that are added, whereas Nuttany instead was actually looking at um, the kinds of objects that are, uh, that are used in the home to bring other levels of meaning uh, in them. I don't know if you wanted to say anything, but... Yeah, and I just want to add that the interior is not always inside in the Thai house. Usually, if they have work, they travel around two to three hours to get to the place where they work. So they might wake up about five o'clock in the morning or even earlier uh, and return quite late in the evening. So during the week, um, it's very much being in bedroom. Um, and during the weekends, that's when mostly you potentialize the use of the house of course, I mean, most of the houses, they, um, inside, they have good televisions, um, sound systems, um, most of them is refrigerator, all the infrastructure, it's very well, I mean, because it, there is an economic system that allows them to pay very um, little money every month for years to have, and that's an idea as well, so they, I'm afraid, and then you have, I mean, this lab that they really use as for all different, um, I'm afraid if I have, have I answered your question? No? Yeah, usually you have about four or five people living in each of those houses. I mean, that's the average rate. Could be more or could be less. And mostly, and you have a r high rate of women leading the families or, or the groups. But I, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you if um, um, these would lead to a mental illness or um, would be too fast if I would answer you. No. Sorry about that. Yes. Think about it. Yeah, there is. Can people hear in the back? No, okay, yeah, let's, let's use the mic. The, the question was, to what extent does this proximity of people living together lead to ag aggression? Yeah. yeah. Um, there is a, yes indeed, I mean, the, for example, in the local media or even outside, it's always um, an image created on the violence within these areas. Um, always pushing a kind of, um, behavior that those, but I, I don't think it's true or it's so easily um, explained. Uh, you could think of as those people, 
Brazil is kind of border of uh, Western world, you could say. Um, and I think one of the ideas of bringing these papers, like giving space to different rooms within modernity, um, and especially those people who live in the periphery, which is about 50% of the whole population, is mainly migrants, so you could say non-white uh, and poor people. So then you would have like different backgrounds uh, than you could say from the Africas and would bring a different ways, means of uh, relationships and, uh, and um I don't know. I don't know if you could answer your question. I'm sorry about that. And you could go to. I don't think it's so easily. Um, it's not so. It's not so. Um, it's not so aggressive. Uh, I mean, it's. You have, uh, of course. I mean, in the ri recent years, uh, you had the drugs, but then it's an international market that comes with cocaine and 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 provokes the whole system. And that's brand new. I mean, in the f to the 50s and 60s, uh, in Rio, uh, Sao Paulo is much younger than favelas and this kind of, it's from the 60s, 70s. It, uh, to the 70s, the whole uh, social science theory were like the favela was the best place to be, or very uh, well settled and very quiet. And I mean, you have, a and then it's much more recently that you have this idea of uh, crime and aggression, and which is so as well an image created on it. It's not just that, and I d don't. It's very open space at the same time and, and time. Yeah, there are many, many different. Yeah, definitely, different absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and definitely not not get in the trap of uh, this yeah. very simple dualism. Um, I oh hope I haven't done that. Actually, I was going to ask Tunisia say if the economic circumstance in um, Sao Paulo were to improve and if the, um, so the criminali criminality would diminish, what, what kind of planning would you like to see instead of what is happening now? Uh, I mean, does that mean yeah, that one would be... Do you need to provide a utopian <laughs> vision? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, possibly, possibly, yes. I mean, that is, um, in the long term, I mean, okay, there are immediate problems which needs to be um, addressed. Mm -hmm. and, um, but presumably, Sao Paulo in 20 years' time will be quite a different city. One doesn't know, it might be actually quite rich in some ways. Um, Sao Paulo, it's quite rich. Um, it's not about wealth. It's one of, it's exactly this inequality. I mean, it, it's so disturbing because you have the third, uh, you have the number of helicopters. It's the third city in the world. I mean, you have all these uh, really rich, but isolated islands. And then this 
ocean of uh, poverty or I don't believe it's so much about the amount of wealth but how you do use that and uh, and it's long it's more than 100 years of laws and regulations and the interest of the would call it elite or, or the yeah. politics. And it's a very interesting moment now because supposedly we have a left-wing um, president and then you have a left-wing uh, mayor. Uh, uh, and even though it's really, really hard, it's going to take decades if it starts right now, if you have a p political will, I couldn't answer I d what could be. I mean, it's like giving, yeah, what do you mean by giving real opportunity to people and really minimal well, I, I guess in my for mind living uh, and but then it's all the mm. working problems and stuff. in my mind was uh, the question was whether you would imagine a planning model mm. which would be derived organically from <laughs> what is happening now with a very strong local democracy or whatever is the right mm. word is or whether you actually imagine a return to um, uh, state planning in some way, so that people can actually spend their, their time in everyday life doing other things besides building houses. It seems like a fun thing to do to me. Yeah. Well, maybe we can um, continue this discussion yeah. over coffee. <laughs> um, unless there's one last pressing question. No. Okay. We'll break now. Uh, and our next session begins at 4.30. So see you all then.